This is Stu Epperson from the Truth Talk podcast, connecting current events, pop culture, and theology. And we're so grateful for you that you've chosen the Truth Podcast Network. It's about to start in just a few seconds. Enjoy it, and please share it around with all your friends. Thanks for listening, and thanks for choosing the Truth Podcast Network. This is the Truth Network. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there was a tiny kingdom, peaceful, prosperous, and rich in romance and tradition. And now, ladies and gentlemen, gather in. A perversion of nature. A man, if you could even call him that, whom God himself has turned his back upon. I give you the limbless man. <laughs> What's the matter with you? It's all right. No harm in it. My fault. Maybe I got a little too close. Hey, friend? Welcome to the Christian Car Guy Radio Show. One degrees in the shade today, folks. We've got ourselves a heat wave. When the heat is hard to take, cool it down and take a break. Take the <laughs> You remember that one, Bill? Take the nesty plunge. Well, 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 you're probably. I love to see how you tie these things in. <laughs> So today's Car Guy show is Once Upon a Time, as you might have guessed, and a whole lot of shaking going on. And, and you know, it's just how my week went and, and what God has been teaching me. Clearly, I just feel like he has had me drinking from a fire hose all week. And so I'm really, really thrilled in such a time as this that God always seems to, have you ever noticed this, Bill, that when you really are going into a hard or difficult season, he gives you an unusual provision that you're, you know, it's like, oh, okay, the reason I'm getting all this is because I'm going to need it. You want me to give you an example? Yeah, go ahead. I was in this unbelievably wonderful Bible study with five of the craziest different people you'd ever met, and you were one of them. <laughs> and after about a year in this absolutely wonderful studies when my daughter came down with the leukemia, to, to have you fellas in my life praying and getting me through, it, it really showed me that that group made just an astronomical difference in, in my life and my family's life. And that that's the biggest example of that that I can think of. Oh, and by the way, thank you. Well, yeah, and by all means, it was my joy and, and, and the fruit of our relationship. And all the, those guys that were in that group, we are all still dear friends, one of which is the owner of this radio station. Um. Stu Epperson. But anyway, <laughs> once upon a time, a whole lot of shaking going on. And I don't know if you've noticed it this year. I have. That is one of the prettiest falls I have ever I mean, to tell you, the leaves are absolutely spectacular. And if you look carefully under the oak trees, Bill, there are acorns like you've never seen. <clears throat> and they're big, huge, huge acorns. Yeah, it makes you want to buy some of those boxes of prepared food and stock them in your basement. <laughs> yeah, because legend is that, you know, when you see a lot of acorns in the fall, that means it's going to be a really, really hard winter because it's always been told that God is feeding the squirrels and the deer ahead of time because they're going to need it. They're going to need to fatten up. So he provides when we're going to need stuff. And, and, and so that was clearly what he was doing with me this week. I, I just can't even believe but, you know, as, as you heard from the beginning of Cinderella, it's this once upon a time. A and that once upon a time word comes actually from the Bible. A and the first place you would find it, surprisingly, is when God made Eve. How cool was that? And if you could, <laughs> if you could just picture for a minute Adam 
right? And here he here stands Eve. Now, Eve is completely innocent. She has no reason to be afraid. Well, she was a pain in the side. Well, yeah, but at this point in time, this is the first time we hear the word in Hebrew that means once upon a time. And it's actually pronounced in Hebrew, pa'am, okay? But if you might remember, like Adam sees Eve and she is nothing to hide. <laughs> no, I, I mean that from a, like she has nothing to hide. She's completely innocent. And, and can you imagine and talking, the intimacy of talking to somebody that has nothing to hide, right? And, and so the, the interesting thing is two words after he sees this, he says now, and that word now in Hebrew is once upon a time, all in one, because Hebrew is a really thick language, and they tend to put a lot of in, stuff in, in, in small letters. If you follow that train of that, how that word is used throughout the Bible, and you think about once upon a time, it's like right this very moment. It's like when in, as this second happens, you're in present time, and that's where God will be found, by the way. <laughs> and when you really know the Hebrew behind that once upon a time word, it's like facing God with your eyes on Jesus, okay, which puts you in present time. And so when, when Adam said now, it's like, and just think of the excitement of like what he had now had. He was looking for intimacy with something, you know, with someone that was like him. And now he's in a position to talk to somebody and them talk to him that has nothing to hide and how to be known and completely known. And I, I'm going to bet, you know, I heard a podcast this week. I heard so many wonderful podcasts this week because I was getting fed of this lady. And she was talking about if Jesus showed up in, in her life and said, what, what, what do you want? You know what she wanted? She wanted to be known. She, she wanted to feel like people really knew her on an intimate level. And, and we really want to know God. That's why we search the Bible. That's why we go all this stuff. And the reason that we want that is because God wants that. And God wants to be known, but he wants to know you. And that's the intimacy of once upon a time. And so it's no, it's no coincidence whatsoever, I'm telling you, that so many stories they try to bring you into the present time in order to get the story told, which is all about God's story. Now, when Paul is describing this in Hebrews 12, he's going to use that. But before we go that, so I'm not just, I'm all over the place today. I'm just sorry. It's just why I use soda in a lot better compact situation than you are sometimes. <laughs> so we talk about the leaves and they're beautiful in God's provision, but I don't know if you've thought about this. Have you ever seen so many dead skunks on the road in your whole life? Deer. Yeah, it's that time of year. And so as a car person, I'm telling you, be careful. There's deer, there's skunks, there's raccoons. And the insurance guy says, don't wash it off before you get it reported. That's right. Because it can be a comprehensive claim then. We've talked about that. Yes, we have. But getting back to the skunk, I had, well, I have my first granddaughter whose name is Lila, and she's a character and a half. We've talked about her many times. But when she was about four, she would say, I smell a stunk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're driving down the road. And I don't know if you thought about it, but I've never felt so blessed as to smell a stunk. Is that like this morning? I'm coming, to, I'm coming to the Truth Network, and I'm like, I smell a stunk. And I'll always say that ever since she said that to me. And I'm like, I don't have COVID. <laughs> 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 you know, it depends on how you, all of a sudden you smell a stunk. And, and, and that's proof you don't have COVID. It I is. Tell you, that is a blessing. Because, <laughs> you know, when my daughter had COVID, the first thing she was like, I can't even, I can't smell anything. I, you know, we went through that and, that, and that was the deal. So... Once upon a time, I smell a stunk. I see the, I, you know, in present time. It, think about it. When you smell a stunk, you are um, immediately in present time. Okay. Does it better than most things. And then you heard a very interesting little clip there from a movie called The Butterfly Circus, which I have posted at my website. If anybody wants to see it, it's under today's, you know, once upon a time, a whole lot of shake and go on. So if you just go to that post at christiancarguy.com, you can watch the whole movie. It's only 12, 20 minutes. You watched it, Bill. I did. Would you agree it's the best 20 minutes? That was a really nice 20 minutes. So you may know the guy's, I I don't know his last name, his name is Nick, and he just, he has no arms and legs. I mean, that that part of the story is true, because this is how this man is. 
And it, they have him in this freak show and this ringmaster. Freak show circus. Right. Freak show circus is where he is at the beginning. But the ringmaster, the butterfly circus, is looking for God in people. And so as he sees Nick for the first time and he really wants to show off what God did with Nick, he gets up close to him there and you hear that scene where he says, you are magnificent. And then he gets spit on. Well, if we really look inside of where we are <laughs> from where Adam was at the point he was looking at Eve and she was absolutely magnificent and so was he. But now, right? Just think what that ringmaster said, that what he said, it just it's kind of burnt in my soul. It says, a man that God himself has turned his back upon. Well, there's only one man that God himself turned his back upon. And so we're going to go there. We have a caller. We don't know where that's going. We got all sorts of stuff. But believe me, we're drinking for a fire hose and Christian Car Guy Theater. Oh, my goodness. Plymouth Progress number nine coming up at the end of the show. So, man, we got so much. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Truth Network and truthnetwork.com. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there was a tiny kingdom, peaceful, prosperous, and rich in romance and tradition. And now, ladies and gentlemen, gather in. A perversion of nature. A man, if you could even call him that, whom God himself has turned his back upon. I give you the limbless man. Oh, 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 once upon a time today on the Christian Car Guy Show and a whole lot of shaking going on. Well, we have Ramona is in Walnut Cove. She's got a burning question, so we want to get to that. So, Ramona, you're on the Christian Car Guy Show. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before I get to that burning question, I have a couple of things. When I smell a skunk and we're driving down the road, I say, oh, I smell burnt coffee. That, to me, is what a skunk smells like. But, yeah. That's, that's back some in rough January, coffee. I got, <laughs> yeah, really. Back in January, I, I got sick. And I complained and I complained to my husband and to uh, some friends at the mission where I volunteer once a week. And I said, I can't smell anything. What is wrong? I can't smell anything. I'd lost my sense of taste. But back then... We didn't have any, what do I say, cognizance of what was happening to us in the, in the world with the outbreak of the COVID. And I'm wondering, I haven't, I haven't been tested, but I am wondering. Anyway, my burning question for you is this. Um, we have heard that little expression, the best is yet to come before November the 3rd, before last Tuesday. And it kept going through my mind. There is a song out there. It's a whimsical song that says, The best is yet to come. Never any day without the sun. Do you know that song, Robbie? I have definitely heard it, and you sang it beautifully, too. By the way, Ramona, that was impressive. Um <laughs> And I'm so glad you sang it because singing comes from the heart. And I think that way it, it, it illustrates the song. I wish I could. I'm just not good with names. I'm, I, you know, but that is a beautiful I've, song and very well, true and very out. relevant for what we're going to talk about here in a minute. Well, yes, but I, I, I only found the, um, oh, what was that guy that died? Sinatra. Frank Sinatra sings The Best Is Yet To Come. But it's not that song. It's I, not I the one you just sang, right? So, hey, here's the good know. news. It's so the good far news. away from what I, Ramona, I remember. There are hundreds and maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands. I don't know. I've never known how many people actually listen, but I hope millions. Um, because the show's right. on all over the country on over 100 radio stations. So maybe somebody listening will know the version that you are referring to and will call <laughs> us. So stay tuned. And anybody that knows that, call us 866 348 Seven eight eight four. Ramona wants to know, and she wants to get that version. Eight six six three four eight seven eight eight four. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you, Robbie. God Take bless. Care. I'm glad God you bless. sang. That was neat. So, 
you know, you heard the thing from Nick, and, and, and you think about who is the only person that God ever turned his back on? It was Jesus. And, and so I had, I'm so blessed, it's unbelievable. I had an opportunity to be part of an interview with Alan Wright on If Not For God this week with Mike Zwick. And, and he was talking about the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. And you may know that the word Ephraim, and this was, again, he, he's just written a book called um, The Power of a Blessing, and it's going to come out shortly. So just go to Alan Wright's website and find out about that. You're going to want to read it. Believe me, it's amazing. But what he was talking about is every Jewish father on the Sabbath is required to bless their children, specifically their sons, by saying, May you be blessed like Ephraim and Manasseh, which is pretty interesting that, you know, they don't say may you be blessed by Moses or may you be blessed like David or, or one of those, but they say very specifically, may you be blessed like Ephraim and Manasseh. And there's, Alan will go into much de- more detail than I'll go into right the second, but what grabbed my attention immediately, because I was studying fruit last week, is that the word Ephraim means double fruit right? A double portion of the fruit. That's exactly what Ephraim means. Manasseh means forget. So when Joseph had these two kids out in the you know, wilderness before he, his father came back, he named them. You know, The first one was Manasseh, and, and the second one, which is forget, because he wanted to forget what his brothers did. Who wouldn't? But the second one was trice fruitful, okay? Now, Jacob got this, the firstborn's blessing, and so when these two boys were presented to Jacob to get blessed, you might remember the story that you know, he put Manasseh under Jacob's right hand, but at the last minute, Jacob pulled the spiritual rue, and Joseph said, no, no, you got the amount of order. And he said, no, I have the exact order, and so he blessed Ephraim first with a double portion, just as kind of alignment with his name. A double portion of what? Fruit. And the second one with, I'll forget, what Alan described, which this is just part of the fire hose I got to drink from this week, was at the cross, right, when God did, in fact, allow the switcheroo to where he took his right hand off of Jesus Christ and he put it on Bill. He put it on Beth Ann. And he gave him the firstborn's blessing. And guess what? You also get the second, which is the grace of he's going to forget your sin. And and you're going to get this package going back to what happened with Adam to where if you'll accept it, you are completely innocent. And, and you really don't have anything to hide because God knows all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's absolutely spectacular. It's spectacular that Jesus did this, and so the Jews have been putting this blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh on their children. What a powerful thing that we can do with our children is to give them the blessing, the double portion, and, and, and that grace to, to forget. So Monday, this is before the election and all this stuff, John Eldridge's podcast probably the best broadcast I have ever heard in my entire life for such a time as this. I mean, it was just like, it just blew my mind how powerful it was and what he was talking about. And he was talking about Ephesians chapter one. And so this also is posted at my website with Butterfly Circus and the scriptures that I'm making reference to. So, and don't forget, we got Christian Car Guy Theater and we're at the house of the interpreter and there's going to be a firewall. I'm just telling you, we are loaded for bear today at Christian Car Guys, so stay tuned. we got so much more coming up. You're listening to The Truth Network and truthnetwork.com. Oh, well, I'll shake it on. It's 101 degrees in the shade today, folks. We've got ourselves a heat wave. When the heat is hard to say, cool it down and take a break. Take a nasty, nasty 
yes, we haven't gotten to the shaking and we haven't got to the nasty plunge, but those <laughs> really could be fun when we get to them, just saying. And by the way, you know, after this segment, it's going to come Christian Car Guy Theater. So if you have a question or something you want to call in, it'd be good to do that. Well, we're still here. 866-348-7884. And along those lines, at 1 o'clock today, Amy Cabo is coming up with a cure. And she is going to be talking about internet crime. And... You know, if you had a chance to listen to Lantern Rescue this week, oh my goodness, what a topic. So you're going to have a chance to interact with them at 1 o'clock today on The Cure. But I wanted to get back to this, what I told you about John Eldridge's podcast. And again, the link is there at christiancarguy.com in the post for today about, you know, once upon a time. But he taught from Ephesians chapter 1 in verses 20 through 23, and he read it first from the message version, which I had never heard in the message version. So... Just strap on your seatbelts and we'll go do this for a minute because in order to understand what he was saying, we got to hear this. So all this, this is the quote from the message, Ephesians 1.20, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him up on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power except from his rule. And now, just for the time being, not just for the time being, excuse me, and now not just for the time being, but forever, he's in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. And at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. But what he went on to say is just think about Paul when he wrote this, when he says, you know, right now a lot of people have a microphone and you may think that that's the main event, but the church is the main event. The, the, the church isn't peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. So here's Paul writing this, you know, at this point in time, how many Christians are there compared to how many Romans? The Romans certainly had the microphone. It would appear they did. And they might even argue that we just killed your leader. They would be wrong. <laughs> but just think about what the talk, you know, they, they had a really bad leader, by the way. I think it was Nero at this point in time. So, I mean, you know, people are getting burned and fire. I mean, this is a lot worse than what you might think, you know, of the candidate that's not your favorite. I mean, Nero is, is way up there. But he didn't have the microphone. But what Paul is saying is, and just think about it, 200 years after this event, right, where is Rome on the scene? I mean, the church has grown, and it's on the move, and the kingdom is advancing. And then you get a, a even worse, you know, if you look at world history, you even get a worse empire of Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan, he boasted that he killed over 10% of the world's population. That's how bad this guy was. And what happened to the church during this period of time? It kept advancing. It keeps moving forward. And so... A lot of people may think they have the microphone right now, but I'm just saying, I was just, it was so en encouraging to me to, to, to get my focus back on what once upon a time, right? The, the story is God's story. He's telling it. And in real time, eyes on Jesus, hearts on Jesus, you know, eyes on Jesus, hearts on Jesus, away you go. So I know all this on Monday, yet. Tuesday night, like probably a lot of you, about every three hours, I had to pick up my phone and see what the results were. <laughs> and, and I was praying with God at the time, like, do I really need to do this? And, and he goes, well, you're just, you know, you're just, you're all tied up in knots. And so that morning when I went to do my quiet time, I still didn't get up at four and went to do that. And, and he said, Robbie, go back and review Hebrews 12, which you may recall Hebrews 12 has everything to do with shaking. And it says in this word, yet once more, which actually is where I got that once upon a time, and this word, once upon a time, signified the removing of those things that are shaken as those things are made. And these things will not be shaken, will not remain. So I started to think about that word shake, and I went and did a study, and you may not be aware of this, I sure wasn't. When Jesus was talking to the guys about John the Baptist, and he said, you know, why did you go out to see this reed? Did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? 
Well, you know, I never thought about that Jesus was actually quoting a prophecy that was in First King, a pretty interesting little prophecy about Israel being shaken. And again, you can see the references to all this at, at ChristianCarGuy.com on this post. But essentially, it was a, it was a, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the name of the prophet. It was like Ahijah. It was a different guy. And, and he said that Israel would be shaken. And, and, and the idea of that word in Hebrew is this is a stalk. It, you know, we translate it as reed, but when you really think about it, like a stalk that has wheat on the top of it or a stalk of corn, which is the first place you find that word used, is when Joseph has his dream, he sees stalks. Well, there's stalks of corn because it's fruit, you see? And as you shake that reed, you know, think about, we, you know, we had those pussy willows back in the day, right? And they were just covered with seeds. And so when the wind hit those things, when they blossom, right? What's going on? Fruit is going everywhere. Just saying. <laughs> you know, you think about the church and Acts when they were persecuted. When, what finally got them out of Jerusalem to go do what it was that they were supposed to do, right? And, and so, oh my goodness, you know, here they all are off to, to, to bear fruit. And so, once again, yeah, there's a whole lot of shaking going on, but as the wind blows the, the, the trees, these beautiful trees, that's what brings down the acorns, guys. And, and those acorns die, and they, be, and they go grow more fruit. And, and yeah, there's a whole lot of shaking going on, but as, 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 as they say in Hebrews here, this is going to be a good thing because there's a whole new planting, right? It looks like you got something you wanted to add, Bill? Well, I'm just thinking it put a totally different spin on it. It's a good thing where I thought the scripture was saying it was a bad thing. Look out for the wind. But the scattering of the seed is wonderful. And you're right. When they came and they burned the temple, that's when they sent all the godly people throughout the Middle East to share the good news. Right. And the church exploded size-wise. Yeah, it just got it got blown out there. So we have Carol Lee, who is in Port Orchard, Washington. Carol, you're on the Christian Car Guy Show. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Carol Lee. Oh, I'm sorry, my Carol Lee. Name, my father's name was Carol. Don't call me that. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, a na- I'm a neighbor and friend of Sarah Linda, too. You know? Oh, anyway, wonderful. Yeah, but the, I was going to say I was really disappointed in the election, but somebody said something that made me think, I was thinking, no matter what, God is in control, but maybe if it would have gone more our way, we would have been sort of lazy and thought, oh, things are being taken care of now. But we have to pray more than ever for our country, because our country is going in the wrong direction. And, you know, it needs to inspire us to just really pray, you know, and not, not give up the fight. Well, I know that, you know, God's in that neighborhood, Carol Lee. <laughs> so I think that is phenomenal wisdom that, that, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves to pray, but we'll, you know, worldly people are going to act worldly. That's their job description. Our yeah. job description is to be on our knees <laughs> seeking his face in present time, you know, looking for him to so we can bear much fruit. So that's Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Carly. I appreciate that. One more that. thing. God is not willing that anybody should perish. You are so. exactly right. Okay. Thanks. You are just, just beautiful. You can see, man. I would love to live on that neighborhood. Wouldn't you? I mean, God's just there. So you may have heard Take the Nest He Plunge, okay? I have on this show about four times. Okay. Well, I got to get to it. My Good. friend James Banks, if you listen to Encouraging Prayer, you'll get the full deal today. It's on at 10... At 11.50, but what he said was, as you're seeking God, you're trying to keep him there and abiding in him. He said, rather than you trying to, you know, bring your will into his or whatever, he said, just take the nest to plunge, right? Just fall back into that, into Jesus' arms. Just, it's, if you've seen the guy do the nest he plunge, right? Mm-hmm. He just falls back into the water. Well, that water is Jesus. And, and you can fall back into God's lap, which is absolutely beautiful. And as you note, in this Christian Car Guy Theater, I want you to pay a little bit of attention to the firewall, which has always been one of my favorite parts of the whole book, is that the picture is that there's this fire and Satan's trying to put it out with water, but back behind the picture is Jesus and he's squirting oil in the fire. 
Well, if you try to put out an oil fire with water, if you've ever done that, it gets a little exciting because, I mean, the water is oxidized by the heat of the oil and it makes the fire bigger. And so as Satan is trying to put water on the church, whenever he did it and wherever it worked out, believe me, the the water will be oxidized and the fire will burn brighter. So this episode of Christian Car Guy Theater coming up. Thank you, everybody, for listening today. You're listening to The Truth Network and truthnetwork.com. And now time for Christian Car Guy Theater with today's episode, The Plymouth's Progress, Part 9. The Plymouth's Progress is purposefully and completely based on John Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress. Today's episode 9 is at ChristianCarGuy.com, both as a podcast with episodes 1 through 8, so you can easily catch up with the series, but also you can find a follow-along of the original book for today's episode, and most importantly, the scripture references that go along with today's episode. And they help greatly in the interpretation of The Plymouth's Progress. It's all at ChristianCarGuy.com. Com. Jimmy, our hero from River Rock, now saw in his dream that Infinity the Interpreter took Plymouth Valiant by the bumper and had him into a little room, where sat two little subcompacts, each one parked on the lift. The name of the elder was Pinto Passion, and the name of the other, Protégé Patience. Pinto Passion seemed to be very much discontented, but Protégé Patience was very quiet. Then Plymouth Valiant asked, <sighs> What is the reason of the discontent of this Pinto Passion? The governor of them would have them stay for his best things for them till the beginning of the next year. But Pinto will have all now. But Protégé Patience is willing to wait. Then Jimmy saw in his dream that a sedan came to Pinto Passion and brought him a bag of treasure and poured it down in his tire. The witch he took up and rejoiced therein, and withal laughed at protege patience to scorn. But I beheld but a while, and he had lavished all away, and had nothing left to him but rags. Then said Valiant to Infinity Interpreter, hmm. Expound this matter more fully to me. These two subcompacts are figures. Pinto Passion is a type of the sedans of this world. And protege patience is a type of the sedans of that which is to come. For, as here thou seest, Pinto Passion will have all now, this year. That is to say, in this world. So are the sedans of this world. They must have all their good things now. They cannot abide till next year. That is, until the next world to wait for their portion of good. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is of more authority with them than are all the divine testimonies of the good of the world to come. But as thou sawest that Pinto Passion had quickly lavished all away, and had presently left him nothing but rags, so will it be with all such men at the end of this world. Ah, now I see that Protoche Patience has the best wisdom, and that upon many accounts. First, because he waits for the best things. Second, and also because since he has waited, he will have the glory of his riches, when the other has nothing but rags. Nay, you may add another. To wit, the glory of the next world will never wear out. But these are suddenly gone. Therefore, Pinto Passion had not so much reason to laugh at protege patients, because Pinto Passion had his good things first. But one day, protege patients will have reason to laugh at Pinto Passion, because he had his best things last. For the first must give place to the last, because last must have his time to come. But last gives place to nothing, for there is not another to succeed. He, therefore, that hath his portion first, 
must needs have a time to spend it, but he that hath his portion last must have it lasting forever. Therefore it is said of the wealthy, Thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Then I perceive it is not best to covet things that are now, but to wait for things to come. You say the truth, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But though this be so, yet since things present and our fleshly appetite are such near neighbors to one another, and again, because things to come and carnal sense are such strangers to one another, therefore it is that the first of these so suddenly fall into amity, and that distance is so continued between the second. Once again, Jimmy saw in his dream that the Infinity Interpreter took Valiant by the bumper and led him into a place where was a fire burning against a wall and a sedan standing by it, always casting much water upon it to quench it. Yet did the fire burn higher and hotter. What means this? This fire is the work of grace that is wrought in the heart. He that casts water upon it to extinguish it and put it out is the devil. But in that thou seest the fire notwithstanding burn higher and hotter, thou shalt also see the reason of that. So Infinity had Valiant about to the backside of the wall, where he saw a sedan with a vessel of oil in its windshield washer reservoir, of the which he also continually squirted, but secretly, into the fire. What means this? This is Christ, who continually, with the oil of his grace, maintains the work already begun in the heart, by the means of which, notwithstanding what the devil can do, the souls of his people prove gracious still. And in that thou sawest that the sedan parked behind the wall to maintain the fire, that is to teach thee that it is hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. Tune in soon for the next exciting adventure in the Plymouth Progress. Now, here's Danny Dipstick and Randy Radiator to review today's episode. Uh huh, Randy. People thought that Valiant's car crusher would never leave the hospital after swallowing eight pintos a day. He was really critical, but the doctors say his condition is stable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no doubt, Pinto Passion lacked horse sense, <laughs> and that's just hard to swallow. <laughs> and with eight horses in your stomach, you would need a stable, Danny. <laughs> oh, boy. But seriously, Danny, that patience illustration really challenges my desire for comfort now and assures me in my trip to the Celestial City to be patient like protege on all the things of this world. <laughs> in other words, no need to pony up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Randy, my doctor told me to take some pony medicine because I was starting to be a little hoarse. <laughs> you know, but Danny, I will say this picture of the firewall is the most encouraging room for me yet. Jesus, who began the fire in me for the celestial city, will keep squirting oil. And, and even though, at times, I feel like things are cooling down, Jesus certainly has the oil in his reservoir to keep my light blazing, in spite of Satan's efforts to put out my fire. Uh -huh, Randy, it's kind of funny that when you pour water on an oil fire, it oxidizes the water. Jesus is using Satan's attacks to actually have our light shine even brighter. Holy cannoli, Danny! <laughs> that was quite an insight. I love that. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, Danny. Hide it under a bushel. No. <laughs> Say goodbye, Danny. <laughs> See you later, radiator. So as we all face those firewalls this week, that's Jesus 
to catch our heart, kind of take the nesty plunge. <laughs> and remember, the water that Satan is pouring on the fire of the church is just going to be oxidized, make the fire that much brighter. The church is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. And once upon a time, always has a happy ending. You're listening to The Truth Network and truthnetwork.com.